Welcome to everyone who is logging in. I'm Gustavo Tolosa from Dallas, and we have Chef AJ and our guest of honor, Dr. Doug Lyle, tonight for an amazing webinar on mastering your environment, part one, and we have three parts. So we'll announce when the other two are coming. So thank you all for joining in, and thank you, Chef AJ. Thank you, Dr. Lyle. How are you both doing? I'll put you on the screen. Very good. I'm hot, but I'm good. <laughs> yeah, it's hot. You are hot. Hey, yeah. It's very hot in Los Angeles now. But yes, I am hot, but I'm also very warm. <laughs> well, very good. I'll give you the, the, the big screen here, AJ, to welcome everyone. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so thank you guys so much for being here. And especially thank you to Dr. Lyle for taking time out of his busy schedule to talk about this subject. So one of the reasons I wanted to do this particular webinar and especially have Dr. Lyle be our special guest is I've been running a program now for several years called the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. And Dr. Lyle actually is going to be speaking at the conference with Dr. Goldhammer in September. And in the program, we have a community board where people can share their thoughts and their feelings and everything like that on a daily basis. And all the time when people relapse or they say they cheated or they fell off the wagon or they ate something non-compliant, they'll post it. And then I, the first question I say to them is, well, where did you get it? And the answer is always in their house. So I've been saying for about four years now, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. And if it's not a question of if you will eat it, only when. And that you don't have to use willpower to not eat something that's not there. Now, I've heard Dr. Lyle speak many times at many different venues. And I always hear him say that we have to work harder on our environment than we even do ourselves, And that the number one rule for healthy living is no junk food in the house. Well, since nobody seems to believe me when I tell them the importance of the environment, I thought I would have a doctor tell you why it's so important to master your environment if you're trying to affect permanent dietary and lifestyle changes. So that's the first question, Dr. Lyle. Why is it so important to master our environment? That, that's just beautiful. It's just it's an amazing thing to hear your own your own thinking coming out of somebody else's mouth. <laughs> Oh my. Um, well, first of all, before I answer this question, I just want to point out that the room that you're looking at, and I, I want people to notice the art on the wall behind me. Now, I have had many critics of my art. And, you know, when, when, when you reach a high level in anything, the critics just come crawling out of the woodwork. So I've had many people criticize my extraordinary artistic skills. So I just want everybody to know that I painted this at a paint night. Um, all by myself. <laughs> it's really good. It's really good. <laughs> it is. It, it bears a remarkable flat facsimile to, uh, I think that's sort of, I don't know, I think it's Van Gogh, but it's pretty close. That's what it is. So uh, anyway, so so much for the critics. Close. Now, even better. <laughs> 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 Even better. That's it. All right. So back to our question. And uh, the question is, why do we, we need to work harder on our environments than we do on ourselves? Now, the reason I say this is that there's sort of two ways of looking at the problem of, of making healthy changes. And we're, we're going to, uh, a typical in psychology and typical in the way the world thinks about these problems is they think about them as the problem is within the individual. In other words, they they see it as essentially a personal weakness, a willpower issue, et cetera. So they, they're looking at the problem within the person. And so people have heard me uh, talk about uh, how I dismiss the concept of emotional eating. And the, what I'm dismissing is the concept that that the uh, that the person has emotional issues that are driving them to do to go off the rails and to go off their program. Uh, the reason why I'm trying to make this point and I try to uh, try to clarify this so that people understand is that these are all ways of looking at the problem as if the problem, the location of the problem is inside the individual, that there's something wrong with the individual. The, uh, the pleasure trap is the exploration uh, and explanation to understand that the problem is not within the individual, the problem is in the environment. 
So the, the problem is that the environment is uh, now out of sync with the identity of a human being. So human identity uh, has many uh, features of it uh, consistent, you know, essentially our animal design. And a key feature of the animal design of all animals is to eat the richest food in the environment. So this is a basic ubiquitous instinct. Uh, this is just how it is. And so you simply have a chip in your head saying, where's the richest food in the environment? Where's the richest food in the environment? Is there any rich food in the environment that I can be eating now? <laughs> this, this is what it's doing. This is what it's going to do and it's never going to stop. It's part of the design. And so uh, if you have artificially rich foods in the environment, um, we're going to eat those. And we're going to eat those way before we eat the other foods. And we will not uh, rest psychologically until they're gone. And this is, uh, this is part of your essentially natural instinctual system. So by trying to reason this thing out and try to figure out why it is that you have this problem and try to work through some personal issues uh, to allow you to have greater willpower to defend this, this is a waste of time. This is not where the problem is located. The problem is that you were designed for an environment of scarcity and you live in an env environment not just of abundance, you live in an environment of artificial concentrated abundance. And so if you bring that artificial uh, abundance into your house, you're going to go crazy. So essentially you have the psychology of a raccoon <laughs> that is designed by nature to eat the richest food in its environment. And the raccoon discovers a dumpster of McDonald's and that's where it lives. And every night it goes in there and it tears apart all the wrappings and everything else. And it gets towards the super rich food. And we wonder why we've got a fat, sick raccoon living in the neighborhood. Okay. So the, the reason why we have to work harder on our environment than we do on ourselves is number one, there's nothing wrong with yourself. And so that's step one. Step two, the problem is the environment. And the, the nature of the problem of the environment is, um, I, I'll stop for a minute so people can absorb the, the thinking here. But the fundamental issue is that your mind is designed to run cost-benefit analysis on alternative options. That's what you do when you go to Expedia and you're trying to figure out where to take a vacation. You look at all the different options to see how much they cost and what they look like, et cetera. That's what your brain is designed to do is constantly be analyzing alternative options and to be selecting the option that has the greatest benefit for the least cost. Uh, when it comes to food, the food with the greatest benefit with the least cost is the food that has the most calories in it per chew. Okay, And also, it also analyzes the difficulty of those chews. So it's going to turn out that the softer food is preferred. Uh, and so cooked, soft, you know, as Alan Goldhammer likes to say, beaded, che beaded cheated, stop, dice, chopped. I can't remember how he says it. <laughs> He's got some clever way of saying this. Essentially processed. So when the foods have been processed in a way and there are the kinds of foods that have been pulled apart and put back together in a way that they are far more calorically dense, those are the foods that would be preferred by any animal, including humans. And they will consume those incessantly uh, as opposed to the alternative of the whole natural foods. And this is a survival instinct. So if you're gonna have success at this program, you're going to need to be diligent at essentially having habits that keep these foods out of the house rather than trying to bring them into the house and then have some kind of remarkable diligence that you're not gonna eat them when they're in the house. That, that's asking too much of the organism and uh, I'm not saying that people can't do it. I'm just saying they're, they're not going to do it very well. Right. Well, you know, you explained this this so well that we're basically a bunch of fat, sick raccoons. And I, I understand it with an uh, an animal analogy. So when people say, well, I, I relapsed because I had a fight with my husband or my dog died or my I lost my job. Yeah. It's really they, lost your homework. Lost your homework. Right. It's because they couldn't have eaten that quart of ice cream if it wasn't in the freezer, no matter what happened. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. And so uh, I don't doubt that when negatively stressful things happen, the brain circles around and says, what's the best cost benefit move that I could make? Can I fix the problem? Okay. 
Can I apologize to my spouse? I shouldn't apologize to them. After all, they were the one that was wrong. So then <laughs> that option's out, okay? So now what are we gonna do? And you're simply looking for the best deal and the, you're looking across different beha behavioral domains. So you're looking through your relationships and you're looking through business and you're looking through your cat or your dog uh, in AJ's case. The, um, and But whatever it is, you're just looking to make the best deal as far as your nervous system can figure. And if there is a screaming deal sitting in your freezer, you can better believe uh, that you're going to take that deal sooner or later. And that's that's what's going to happen. So um, the research, for example, on emotional eating uh, and stress eating has shown that there's really not much to it. There's a little bit to it. And it turns out it looks like it's probably just as likely or close for people to eating be eating crap uh, when they're stressed out as when they're celebrating. Okay, so uh, it looks like in essentially any turbulence at all is going to cause people to uh, make a little shift and do something different, uh, different than what they intended. So that means that the solution is not going to have to be have a stress-free life with no ups or no downs in it, that we're going to somehow master this even keel. That's a, a ludicrous solution to the problem, and it's not diagnosing the problem correctly. The problem is that you're going to run cost-benefit analysis on options in the environment, and if there's a fantastic uh, option in the environment from the standpoint of your uh, the calculations of your natural history. In other words, if it tastes great, and the reason it tastes great is because it's a tremendous amount of calories per bite, then count on it. Whether you're bored, unhappy, really happy, or nothing at all, you're likely to swallow it sooner or later. That's right. So, Dr. Kyle, I think anybody that is familiar with your work or my work probably agrees with you about the environment being important, whether their environment is cleaned up or not. But what about these people? They're generally the people I meet that are following those strict weighing and measuring programs that say, well, it doesn't really matter what's in your environment. You just have to like say, not my food, not my food, and walk around all day saying not my food to coexist with that. Does, does that affirmation work? Because that's what they say to do in these programs. Just go around saying NMF, NMF not my food, not my food. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my God. The uh, Well, if, if such things were true, there would be so many, there, there would be so much, much less need for any psychological help. Uh, and, and I could eliminate any number of problems in uh, 15 minutes of per session. This is absurd. Uh, I, I'm not going to say that there aren't people that haven't been successful uh, adopting such a thing. The, in other words, there's people that are, that, well, let me give you an example of why it is that this can get confusing for some people. Um, if we were to take something like hypnosis, uh, hypnosis, if you actually use it in the laboratory with people that are competent, you'll never find hypnosis being able to be help people, for example, stop smoking. It just simply doesn't work. However, you will meet individuals that were planning to stop smoking and wanted to stop smoking and went to a hypnotist. And a month later, they're not smoking. And they went through this process with this hypnotist and they're like, wow, that really helped me. What the people are not seeing is the fact that they had a whole confluence of factors that were pushing them to be successful at that time. They had a lot of determination to do it. Uh, the hypnotist was a supportive uh, individual at that point, but it wasn't the hypnosis process that had anything to do with it. The, uh, in the same way that people could go to some program and they could be told some mantra and, uh, and that they might use that mantra, but that mantra isn't what it is that the... And so I already know that such that such techniques are going to just crash on the rocks. You are a raccoon and you are designed by nature to eat the rich food. And if it's in the environment, you're going to get it. Now, if it turns out that you have a, a, a confluence of factors, super high motivation, you've got a dress you've got to get into because your daughter's getting married in 90 days and you decide that you're going to walk around saying, not my food, not my food. What's really rattling through your head is not, it isn't not my food. It's, oh my God, I've got a wedding to get into in 90 days. And my husband's ex, you know, bitch is going to be there. 
<laughs> okay. There's all kinds of motivation flowing through the, flowing through that person's head. That's actually the reasons why it is that they're able to hold it together. The mantra on top isn't having anything to do with it. So uh, yeah, that's that's not a good strategy. Uh, <laughs> there's a pretty good ad on TV. I, I forget who who did it, uh, but it's something about there's all these security leaks and threats and the guy's having hard to get to sleep at night and he's hoping that his whole system doesn't get crashed by some outside agency. And the, the ad is hope is not a strategy. <laughs> it's like, of course, it's not a strategy. And so a mantra is not a strategy. A strategy is to be diligent at actually keeping your environment in, in with circumstances that are going to be conducive to your success. Right. That's how to do it. Okay. So do you think that the people that are unable or unwilling, if you will, to clean up their environment, do you think that it's really true that they can't or that maybe they're using it as an excuse? Because one of my clients recently told me, because I, I, I said to her, you know, I don't care if you go out and get the food, you know, that's what you need to do. And she said that, that if she was really honest with herself, that having the non-compliant food in her house was a comfort to her because number one, she knew it was always there. And number two, when she relapsed, she could blame her family. And number three, if she had to go out for it, she would really have to deal with the fact that this really was a problem. So we have people that say they don't even ask their family. Like I understand like if you have a really mean husband and he says, forget it, I work hard, I make the money, it's being there. But the majority of the people, in, at least in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, that have unclean environments, I have offered to Skype for free to their families. They do not take me up on it, and they will not even ask their family to clean it up. So why, why would you not be there? Because you've always said that a loving family will support somebody in recovery, but what makes a person not even willing to ask? It's a really good question, AJ. And so you, you threw several different things at me with different different people and different issues. Um, but let's just hang on to this last one that you just asked me. The there there would be some very interesting reasons why people would not ask their family for help. The uh, a good mantra if the, if you're gonna if you're gonna have a mantra in your head as a psychologist or someone who's trying to analyze motives. A good mantra in your head is whenever you don't understand something, always look for status. Uh, so whenever you can't understand why somebody's doing what they're doing, if it doesn't make sense to you, always look for status. And status will almost always be the variable that is the deciding factor in why they are doing something unusual that you can't figure out. So in this case, the situation is, is that the person is embarrassed to uh, come to the family and tell the family, listen, I cannot manage this problem and stay on a narrow path that I need to be on uh, if, for example, I'm going to lose 30 pounds or 40 pounds. So let's say, let's just paint a picture. The picture could look very differently depending on a person's circumstances. But let's suppose that we've got a, uh, a 40 year old woman who's married, has a couple of kids. The kids are young and slender enough, they're not having a problem. The dad is slender and he's not having a problem, but the, the, the lady's 30 or 40 pounds overweight. And uh, as many women are, women are inherently very interested in nutrition. So uh, it's likely, so she's run into us, she's heard you, now she's in your group and she knows the right direction to go, but she's really struggling with this uh, for several reasons. But one of the biggest reasons is, is there's an awful lot of temptation inside of her own house. And now the question is, so she hears from us that for God's sakes, you're going to have to work on your environment and get your environment as clean as possible or else you're in trouble because you're a raccoon and you're going to go through that trash can and swallow everything in the trash can uh, that's rich. And we're going to leave, incidentally, the lettuce and the tomatoes behind. <laughs> that's what would happen in the McDonald's trash can. Now, so... That's what's that's what she's facing, and the, the the husband looks at her like, "Hey, just eat less. What's the problem? Just use a little discipline." And the kids are like, "Why should I want to eat anything different than I'm eating?" So they are all in the pleasure trap, but they are not showing any evidence of the pleasure trap and no motivation to get out of the pleasure trap. 
So as a result of that, she's surrounded by uh, supernormal stimuli, i.e. pleasure trap foods. And all she has in her is her conscientiousness and her intelligence that are looking at this situation and they're saying, wow, you know, with enough conscientiousness and intelligence, I should be able to, you know, sail this boat to the other side. I should be able to do this, but you can't. And the reason is, is that your conscientiousness and intelligence were not designed to override that instinct. Okay. So as a result, uh, this is probably a futile, you know, situation, uh, pretty close. I mean, I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying I wouldn't expect it to be done. And that, that is an important revelation that I wouldn't expect it to be done because everybody else expects that it should be able to be done. So the woman herself expects that it should be able to be done. And the, the husband would expect that it would be able to be done. And so as a result, it's embarrassing to say to the husband, I can't do it if that stuff's in the house. Because his attitude is going to be, wow, what kind of weird weakness is this? This makes you look like some kind of a pathetic freak that uh, has some lack of self-control here. And the woman herself can be a little puzzled by this and feeling like, well, one of these days, she's just going to have to get it together and really make a decision and get committed. And the truth is, she's already committed. She's already done a tremendous amount of research. She already knows a great deal. But what she's underestimating is she's underestimating the power of the environment. Okay. Which brings me back to the book that I wrote. Okay. The entire point of the pleasure trap was to explain not only to normal people, but also to psychologists that the problem is in the environment. It is not inside the individual. There's no lack of willpower. There's no lack of intelligence. There's no lack of conscientiousness. There's no lack of intent. Okay. But what you have is you have an instinct that is being overwhelmed by its essentially by a supernormal environment that the instinct is screaming to the individual what they should do that would be the best cost benefit analysis for their survival. And that is eat the richest food in the environment. OK, so the core issue here is embarrassment because she's embarrassed to to say, whoa, this problem is a lot harder than I thought it was. And I'm, I don't think that I can solve it unless we have an, an important change in the environment. Then the problem is, is that she can intuit probably correctly. But in most cases, the husband and kids are going to be like, no way. We're not doing this. We're not going to clean up this environment. That's unreasonable. OK, and so they're they're caught in a trap, too. But they're not, they're not they don't have any motivation to get out of it because they're not evidencing any problems that are bothering them. And so this is actually quite a dilemma here. Uh, the solution uh, is always a reduction of distortion of the understanding of reality. So this is how you this is how you reduce mistakes and mistake uh, reduce tragedy is to actually educate the mind uh, so that the individual actually understands the realities better. So um, so it's important that that this person understand that this is not a personal weakness, that this is not uh, something to be embarrassed about. It's actually something that they need to more deeply understand that this is actually an almost checkmate. It's almost checkmate. Can, can you get out of this checkmate? Yes, you can. How are you going to get out of this checkmate? By getting control of the environment. Okay, that means we're going to have to educate uh, interested parties. If the husband wants to see that wife have higher self-esteem, feel good about herself, drop 20 or 30 pounds, be more attractive. If he's interested in that, she needs to sit down and say, listen, I've now, I'm now learning that this is an extremely difficult problem. It's not a simple problem. It's actually a problem that not very many people are able to solve unless they have support within their environment. Okay. And so if you are with me on this, and if you'd like to see me to succeed, I actually need you to make some sacrifices. Okay. Otherwise I'm not going to be able to be successful. So can we try this out? Can we give this a try for, you know, 60 days or 90 days and just see whether or not I can get in a groove and whether I can accomplish this. This is the kind of discussion that needs to be made, uh, but it can't be made from a standpoint of thinking that the problem's inside you 
and that it's embarrassing and that we can't tolerate the status loss. No, we have to be confident and understanding that there is nothing wrong with you, that this problem is actually very, very tricky. Um, we, we go from there in confronting the family. You have no idea how many people you helped with that explanation. People are saying, I thought I understood the pleasure trap, but this has really reinforced it and explained it more thoroughly. And and without you basically talked about the people without knowing them. That's exactly what it is. It's usually a wife, but occasionally it is a man. Yeah. And usually the spouse and children are thin. And therefore, we all know if you're thin, you have to have peanut butter in the house because that's a law, apparently. But yeah. sometimes the husband and the kids are are very overweight and sick as well, and they still don't want to do it. And you briefly touched on self-esteem. And does this play a role in the status and embarrassment area? Because you once said in a McDougal lecture at the Advanced Study Weekend that the number one predictor of self-esteem in a female is her weight. And ever since you said that, a light bulb went off because it's almost like literally the more overweight the woman is that I meet, the lower the self-esteem. And Maybe I was just lucky because I was only about 60 pounds heavier than I am now. But when I realized this, because I went to True North and you basically told me about the environment, I came home and I said to Charles, we can't, we didn't have really crap in the environment. We were already SOS free, but we had things like nuts and baked chips. And I said, I can't have this in the house. And he said, well, he goes, I'll just hide it. I live in an, a thousand square foot apartment. I found it. And I said, look, I really can't have it. And he said, okay, I'll take it to work. And it, I mean, I didn't have to be mean about it. It, there was really no, I, I mean, I guess I just assume if you married to somebody, you love them and they want the best for you. And it seems like a very reasonable request. That's why I don't understand. Now I understand why the spouse will not talk to the family because of the embarrassment. Right. But what I really don't understand, and maybe the family members will be watching this replay, is why if you really loved your mother or you, uh, you're a kid that, that is being you know, this way, because when we grew up, we had two choices, take it or leave it. And if you're the spouse, whether you're overweight or not, if you love this person and wanted the best for them, why would you not support them? This is what I really don't understand. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's a there's multitude of reasons, reasons why I might not support them. And yeah. I'm getting an echo. Are we okay? Okay. The um, a One of the reasons, obviously, is that the individual themselves is in the trap. They almost always are. So uh, in anybody that's ever walked this walk knows how tricky it is. And anybody that has never walked this walk but has been told about it has trepidation about it. They don't think they want to even try to do it because they can sniff that they couldn't do it. And so if you've got a wife that is uh, saying, listen, I need to actually have the environment changed. Don't think that that husband isn't thinking, wait a second, wait a second, where's my beer and Fritos going to go? You know what I mean? And what, what, what about this? And what about that? What about my hot dogs? We'll hold everything. What about my cheese sandwiches? I like to do grilled cheese sandwiches with mayonnaise. What's, what about that? No, 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 no. We can't do this. And so they're instantly going to get defensive and they're, they're also not going to have enough insight uh, into uh, th this is, this is one of the more bizarre, confusing problems that face people in the modern world. One of the most important ones for their, for their personal happiness is understanding weight and food and how this all fits together. And everybody's horrendously confused. And so uh, there's many reasons why they're confused. That is, you will see a lot of slender, beautiful people eating crap. You know, like, what is that about? And the, the answer is usually they're young is one thing, but not always. And the other, the, the issue is individual differences in genetics. So there's people that are eating uh, tr tremendous amount of crap with both hands that, that doesn't stick to them. It's just, that's just biology. That's how that works. Uh, it's statistically relatively unlikely. So in other words, most of the time, the average member of the species, if it eats rich food, is going to get fat. That, that, is a, that, that is why the United States looks the way it looks. That's why the average woman in the United States gains two pounds a year from her 16th birthday to her 36th birthday and is 40 pounds overweight on her 36th birthday. That is, that's not a crime. That's just a national process that's going on uh, that has been creeping that direction for the last 50 years as people have eaten more and more and more processed rich foods. Uh, that's what's happened. So the, um, so, but the point is, is that there are anomalies all over the place.
So you're going to see in your own office, if there's 50 people in there, there's going to be 10 people that are thin. And so as a result, we, we look at these people and people see what they're eating and they don't seem to be eating much different to, than anybody else. And so everybody starts thinking that the reason why somebody's overweight is that they don't push themselves away from the table and they don't exercise and they're just a little bit too much of a glutton and that the real solution is to get control, you know, not eat so much. That's what everybody thinks. And every, everybody thinks that the fatter you are, the more that glutton chip that you have. That's what they think. They don't think of it as subtle individual differences in biology, in the efficiency of digestion and very slight differences in sensitivity to feedback signals for satiation. They're not thinking tiny, tiny little biological variations. They're thinking really big time issues of just self-control and, and, you know, uh, essentially conscientiousness and intelligence and willpower. That's what they're thinking. They, they have no insight into this. And so that husband uh, who wants his beer and his chips, and after all, he only has a little bit of a belly. He's only about 20 pounds overweight, but he's six feet tall, so it doesn't really look that bad. Meanwhile, our girl is five foot three, and she's 30 pounds overweight, and that looks very substantial. And not only that, because that uh, body morphology and physical attractiveness is relatively more important to females than it is to males in terms of their total mate value. It's gonna turn out that this problem is differentially hitting the female mind a heck of a lot harder than it's hitting the male mind, okay? I'm not saying that there aren't men that are embarrassed and puzzled about their weight, there are, but there are more men that are uh, 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 essentially oblivious or really not that upset about their their moderate weight problem whereas their wives if they have an uh, have a moderate weight problem are very disturbed by this and if they try to solve the problem conventionally they're going to fail and if they find us they know what the solution is but the solution is pretty damn radical relative to the the culture and so to to educate that man and the family <clears throat> into what it's gonna to take to have uh, spectacularly and lasting success on this problem uh, means actually quite a revolution in their household into what that household's gonna look like. That's not something for all of the people that will find us and hear about this and know what it is to do. There's not gonna be a lot that are gonna be able to execute on it. And one of the reasons for that is gonna be exactly the problem that we're looking at. The solution, once again, is we have to drill into the details of this social dilemma and we have to reduce the distortions that are in sitting inside the heads of these family members so that they understand that the admission of, of this problem and the request for help and assistance on this problem uh, is in no way indicative of anything um, that, that, is, that is appropriately or would be in any way reasonably an embarrassable offense, okay? In other words, we have to be confident that we have a problem that is difficult and that is we're gonna require environmental uh, cooperation. This would be the equivalent of a, of a, think of yourself as a 17 year old teenager who has discovered in the last year and a half that you're an alcoholic and you live in a family where the, the, the mom and dad both drink and your big sister and big brother both drink, but they all are able to drink in moderation. So they're not actually alcoholics, but you are, okay? And you come to them and you say, listen, I'm in trouble and I am an alcoholic and I'm requesting that we get all the alcohol out of the house. I don't mind that you drink elsewhere because I'm not trying to impose that on you. I know that you guys don't have the, this problem that I have, but for some reason I'm a little bit different and I got a problem and I need your help. Can you imagine the, the abusive dynamic? If you have parents and siblings that say, that's weak, that's weak, okay? You, you no, you should be able to handle this. It's not reasonable for us to not have alcohol in the house. Come on, that, that's imposing a ridiculous price on us, okay? That, that is obtuse to have that view. 
And um, it, we are hopefully uh, among educated and sensitive people, we understand, oh my God, if your 17 year old comes to you with that, all the alcohol should be out of the house that afternoon. It's gone. Okay, this is a team effort now. And we understand, oh boy, we, we, we got somebody who wants to do something really important for themselves and they need to do it. If we're not gonna do it, that's okay. If we're not suffering that much and we're not that motivated, that's okay. But we're gonna drink at the bar or we're gonna drink with our friends at the game, but we are not gonna drink in this house. Not if we've got somebody that's fighting for their life. So that's, that's how, that's the moral high ground that I would want uh, any of our clients to have when they look at the situation and to say, listen, you know, this is what I'm going to do and I need your help. And it's appropriate that you should help me. And uh, if, if we need to force feed uh, some of this, these family members, this webinar or, or a, a greater detail of education about this, then we need to. And um, if we have to take them through that process, uh, if we have to, you know, whatever it is that we need to do, the, the solution is the gentle but persistent education of the individuals in the environment, because guess what? They're your environment. Right, and, and as you're talking, Mary's saying that her husband is watching this, but still refuses to remove the non-compliant food from the house. Yes. You know, and, and I don't understand it because like like they'll say, well, this is my problem. I shouldn't expect people to cater to me. But I always think you cater to the person that is the I don't want to say the word disabled. But like if you have a kid that's in a wheelchair, yes. you have a whole family and the kid is in a wheelchair. So you need to build a wheelchair ramp for the kid to get in and out. You build the ramp and everybody uses the ramp. You don't say, well, I, I don't need a ramp. So therefore, we're not going to have a ramp. A hundred percent. I 100% agree with you. I just don't understand how a husband or a child, whether they're stuck in the pleasure trap or not, when they see this webinar, how reasonable your request is and how you're explaining this, that they would still refuse. I mean, I don't get it. So I guess some well, they have, not, sometimes yeah. they're going to have to have this percolate on them. And uh, we have to be, as I said, we have to be persistent uh -huh. uh, and we have to uh, circle around and push. And then sometimes we, you know, Sometimes we have to uh, demand and actually uh, I will, you know, depending upon how you know, we have to figure out what the personalities are and what the circumstances are. But I have had people, I've told people uh, that have been in a battle like this, food comes in the house, you take it out to the garbage. No problem. Okay. If, 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 that, if we have to play that way, we will. You take that food out and you empty it into the garbage can so that it cannot be retrieved. Okay, and we're just gonna do that a few times. Uh, you know, we, we see this just, it's very easy to take a half gallon of ice cream and just throw it right in the garbage or put it right down the garbage disposal. Let's just have a fight about it. Okay, so sometimes we need to, we need to have a showdown about how this is gonna be. And, um, and you know, that, that, that's what it's gonna have to be sometimes in order to, to get people's attention. I mean, again, these analogies that we've given are, uh, are uh, actually perfectly appropriate and they are good matches uh, for the truth. And they're not exactly matches because in the case of the alcoholic, our, our little lady here is not in any more compromise than the guy. Okay, she's no more of a pleasure trap addict to this food than anybody else in her family. Okay, so it's a little bit different. Um, it's as if there are four alcoholics in the house, and one of them decides, I'm gonna make a break for it. I need everybody to be cooperative. And the other ones are saying, no. Now that, you know, this is this is sort of showdown time. This is where you start pouring, pouring the wine down the sink. And you're like, yeah, we are gonna have a clean environment. You can, I, I'm not imposing uh, any other lifestyle changes on you. You can go right down the street and drink all you want call an Uber and get yourself home, but not in this house. Okay. okay. So this so, is, if you can't pull this off, um, then, you know, then we've got a problem that the person may be checkmated by the fact that they are agreeable human, uh, empathic and sensitive, and that the other person on the other side is disagreeable and obstinate, lacks conscientiousness, and, uh, and essentially lacks the, the natural will to aid and abet somebody close to them. And there are people with such limitations 
And, you know, as you can tell by my description, I don't admire them. Mm -hmm. Well, we have several women typing that they would, their husband would divorce them if they threw out the non-compliant food. Mm -hmm. Maybe that would be better because then they could be skinny. And then um, they're saying, well, then how can they structure their environment so they can handle it? I, I don't see how you can structure it, you know? Well, it, this, is, this is a matter of degree. So when we talk about the environment, we don't want to talk about it as a sort of a fixed all or nothing thing. The environment is a continuum of relationships between the person and different variables in the environment. So a person says, well, I go to work and there's crap all over the workplace. And there's, you know, I had one person, I think, worked at a food factory. And at the food factory, they literally had junk food all over the place all day long. I can't remember what was being manufactured. I think they work for, you know, Mars or M&Ms or, you know, I mean, something like that. I can't, I can't even remember what it was. The, um, but the point is, is that the environment that you could control in that situation is all the food that you bring with you. So you essentially do as best you can by having the rights to and the access to really healthy food all day long right under your hands. And so now you've changed your environment so you've got better choices. And the the M&Ms and the Mars bars are still floating around for free. But the point is, is that you've got a better chance. So we've now, we have changed the environment to some degree and we've made the odds of success greater. Uh, we are still in shark infested waters, but it's difficult. Now for the people that say that their spouses would divorce them if they threw the crap out, of course, what we do is we go through a process of warnings and we go through a process of, of questioning and cross-examination. And we go through a process of disagreement and argument and uh, and then then we we give them a warning and we say, listen, you know, if you're ready to say, listen, I'm going to throw it out because uh, this next two weeks, I want to really see if I can get clean. I need a, I need a running start at this. And then maybe we can take a look at it. Now, if your spouse is not willing to have an environment clean for a couple of weeks, it is a totally reasonable for you to dump that pizza in the trash. Now. If you do that and they file for a divorce, wow, that this you, you talk about the worst case scenario. You, you think that that individual literally is going to go to those lengths behind that inconvenience? Not a chance. OK, that 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 is a worst case scenario inference from a high conscientious individual who is overestimating the worst case scenario by a factor of a thousand. So. My attitude is you test the water, you see what happens. If they literally file for a divorce, you can always beg and plead and say, oh, gee, I'm sorry, I'll bake through the chocolate cake. And then then they're not going to come home because we threatened once and threw a pizza out. No, I don't think so. What we're talking about here is if you live in essentially a very difficult environment, um, it, it may require you to go through some difficulty in order to carve out a, a, a bulkhead of support for yourself. It may be not easy to do, okay? It may involve some contentious uh, conversations. This is interesting, okay? It's interesting that, that this would be that difficult and that we would have such self-indulgence and such determination not to aid and abet somebody in our family who's trying to make a positive move. These are enlightening data uh, for people to look at their situation. Fair enough, okay? But I, I wouldn't be intimidated by the worst case scenario, even if somebody threatened it. Somebody said to me, well, if you throw out that pizza, I'm going to divorce you. It'd be like, really? Hey, really? Um, I think I'd be willing to call that bluff. So, <laughs> the, uh, so anyway, that's that's uh, my I, I'm all infuriated because anybody nobody should put up with that kind of hostility, although I do understand that the people on the other side of this are pleasure trapped and anxious and they can feel the inconvenience of their life about that they might not be able to surround themselves with, with super normal food and they're addicted and they don't want to actually face it. And my attitude is you don't have to face it. You just have to be mildly inconvenienced. Right. right? Because they can still eat it outside the house. That's the thing. Of course they can. Of course they can. 
Yeah, so many people are commenting how sad it is that people have such toxic relationships that their spouse would actually even threaten divorce like that, that it is sad. So if somebody wanted to get more coaching on this, you offer 12 slots a week at esteemdynamics.org. They could book a private session where you could talk them through this, right? Yeah, and sometimes that's useful because everybody's case is different and the personalities on the other side are different. So sometimes it's useful for me to hear the nature of the personality dynamics between the two people and sort of engineer a strategy that that makes sense based on what I can tell about the people that are involved. Mm -hmm. So there isn't a one size fits all a lot of times. So you're right. Sometimes it's real useful for, for people to call me and us to talk uh, situations through like this where there's conflicts of this nature. Right. Terrific. Yeah. So one of the things I hear a lot, and again, I, I really think it's an excuse because I'm I really all off think... now, by the way. What? What'd you say? <laughs> I, I'm spoiling for a fight. <laughs> oh, oh no! I think I think you're doing great. But, bring, but bring bring on the guy who's going to stop this process. Like you know, I, I'm ready to chop him up. But that's yeah, all right. Let's go Mary's, on. It's Mary's husband, so maybe Mary will contact you. So yes. I always feel that that you know if you really want to do something, you will no matter what. And that a lot of what people say is an excuse. And so one of the things I hear a lot is that well. It's okay to have non-compliant food in the house if it's if, if I'm an ethical vegan. It's okay like if it's a cheese pizza if it's real because I'm not going to eat it. And if it's okay if it's real ice cream because I'm vegan. But from what I see, that just having any non-compliant junk food in the house, it still makes can cause a relapse. Maybe you won't relapse on the non-vegan one, but then you'll go out and get the vegan version because I think. Don't you believe that just having it around and having it when you have to look at it when you have to smell it, I. I, I couldn't do that, you know? Well, I'm not even sure what your question is. Um, like like the, the, the house should be clean. Even So what I'm saying is, let's say you love chocolate ice cream. You still shouldn't have vanilla ice cream in the house. It's sort of like if you're an alcoholic that always drank vodka, it's probably still not a good idea to have beer in the house, that all the junk food should be removed. Well, whether it's ideally, but this is, this is where we talk about the environment being a matter of degree. Mm -hmm. So... There's essentially continuums of enticement in environments. And so the, what we want is we want, um, when, when people are dealing with other people, for example, we may, we may be willing to negotiate for the best environment that we can get and run an experiment behind that. And so essentially, if, 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 I, if I'm not into alcohol and I'm not into ice cream and, and you got a husband who likes to drink beer and eat ice cream, then you may be willing to basically say, oh, okay, listen, we, we, that's fine, but I can't have any cheese in the house because that's a disaster for me. So we, we, may, we may wind up needing to negotiate as best we can uh, for, to get as good of an environment as we can. I, I would agree with you that when people are trying to do an ultimate weight loss, which is no joke, okay, this, is a, this is a very tall order for uh, any human being to, to try to eat on such a narrow pathway in search of the self-esteem and esteem gains that come from essentially being very fit and yet that not coming naturally to us uh, if, we, if we eat a rich diet. So this is, this is an unusual path and a, an outstanding goal for people to have, uh, not an easy one to do. And it's hard enough to do if you are in 100% control of your own environment, it is going to be considerably more difficult if we've got other people to negotiate with. And I, I think you, you also pointed out something very interesting in your own history, AJ, which was fascinating. Charles, who is uh, unbelievably pleasant, uh, very intelligent and completely knowledgeable about all this stuff and always has been. Um, that guy literally said, what about if I hide it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so right away we see Charles, who's incredibly reasonable and totally on your side, uh, was instantly thinking about his own inconvenience and trying to defend his 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 environment. Okay, so the um, and so this is that that will tell you. And then we found out that you basically said no, no can do. That's not going to fly. So now now we. You, you negotiated to the level that you needed to, but it was a negotiation process. And so people may need to go through their own negotiation processes 
Um, uh, and those negotiation processes may, they may be mildly or moderately contentious. And they, I also want to point out to people that you have a very strong moral high ground in negotiating with people about changes when you explain that the changes are temporary, that you're running experiments. Okay. Uh, the reason is, is that it's incredibly reasonable to tell people that we're going to run an experiment for 28 days and that that's all that's going to be required of them, that we just need to do this to see how it works for us. Uh, quite frankly, if you have a spouse that we educate gently about this, that we explain what it is that we're up to, that we explain what goals we're trying to reach, and that we ask for a 28-day window of opportunity to try to execute on this, if the answer to that is a bunch of Russian yet, 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 then my, my attitude is, it, it's it's time to get in their face, okay? It's time to have a showdown and actually have a fight about it because um, the, the, that that is unreasonable, and they need to be called on the carpet uh, for for being unreasonable. Uh, we can see that Charles, being the reasonable person he did, uh, he has immediately conceded. In other words, he pushed back a little bit. He was like, "Wait a second, this is going to get inconvenient. My food really isn't unhealthy. You know, what if I just hide the food from you so you don't know it?" And I, you ran that through your head and you said, you got to be kidding me here, Charles. You're not going to hide that rich food from this raccoon. Nope. Never nope. going to happen. Right. Okay? And so that, that's why, you know, but, but this is a process. And so we want to we want to be as sensitive and as intelligent as we can be about the people on the other side. But we also uh, something that you said that I would contradict. And you said, um, if people are going to do it, they're going to do it, et cetera. And I would. I would actually say that kind of fits your personality, AJ, but it doesn't fit human human nature in general. Okay. Uh, it's going to turn out to be that very often people would have been capable of doing something, but they ran into a constraint from social pressure and they got stopped. Okay. So, uh, so many people are much more sensitive to the social pressures in their environment uh, than you would be. And as a result, uh, I'm, I'm very wary and concerned about, about the social pressure that people face and how that pressure that they face can easily be the difference uh, between failure and success. And so we need to pay attention to that aspect of the environment uh, carefully, and we need to negotiate it with as much intelligence and savvy as we can. All right. Wonderful. You know, uh, you mentioned about negotiating it. What some of the people have done, and it's worked for them, is they there is such a thing you can buy called a locked food safe so that for example like let's say the kid has to have peanut butter but peanut butter is a real trigger for the person yeah. there they it's like dark you can't see through it has a combination so the family can still have it there but the person that struggles with that food they don't have to smell it or see it or deal with it and and i and some of my very successful clients have used those to negotiate it so that the crap could still be in the house but not so that the person that has a problem with it has to see it Amazing, perfectly yeah. reasonable 21st century solution. Yeah. Uh, what do you know? And it's something that uh, that I, I never would have thought of. Yeah, right. it works good, and they're not very expensive. And they're you can put them in the refrigerator, you can put them in the cabinet. So, so for the people that really for think like nuts and chips, it's, they work great. And yeah. and so that's a, it's a very inexpensive option, much cheaper than a divorce lawyer. So, yeah. So you know. <laughs> Your environment is wherever you are. So if you're on vacation and you're around rich food, that's your environment. And so people struggle when, when they're in that environment. And have you ever noticed that we, I, I see a lot of people that can white knuckle it through these experiences, but then they go home to their clean environment and then they end up binging or relapsing just from like a week seeing, I mean, can sometimes just being around rich food all the time just kind of like percolate so that at some point you just have to give in? Well, let's think about this. There's a reason why they advertise the food. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and that is because they're doing their very best through vision and through auditory channels, which is what they can reach us with. They can't reach us through tactile channels and they can't reach us through olfactory or taste, but they can reach us through vision and they can reach us through auditory channels um, and to motivate our behavior to eat certain foods. So that's why the, air, the, the, the television is 
literally bombarding us with advertisements for food because it works. Okay, so clearly, um, if you are if you are being uh, essentially uh, the, the the brain is a data analytic machine running cost benefit analysis on opportunities. If you keep reminding them, oh, Papa John's pizza, Papa John's pizza, look at Papa John's pizza, look what it looks like. Here, listen to the sound of it. Okay, watch somebody else eat it and watch the smile of delight on their face as they take that bite. So it, all the empathic mechanisms are firing off. In other words, at all. Uh, and of course, the people are thin and pretty and cute and cute kids and, you know, no acne and good, good hair. <laughs> In other words, winners, winners eat our crap. OK, so these are these are all the messages. Well, you got a cruise ship. And even if you manage to hold it together, you have not only seen the food and you've heard everybody smack their lips and eat the food, but you've been able to smell it. OK. So, of course, you've just gone through a whole week of having it advertised in your face. And so I'm not surprised that even when you get out of that environment, you've got all these memories of what you've seen cascading through there because you've just been essentially in a very concentrated food advertisement. Wow. So that's going to go if you go hang out with your sister in Germany at Oktoberfest and, you know, it's all it's all beer and I don't know, knock worse or whatever it is that these people eat. Though the point is, is that if you're around a bunch of super normal stimuli and it's hitting you at every turn, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Thank you. That that makes a lot of sense. Well, I think that people are going to understand this. They'll probably want to watch it again. And they need to know that if they need help tweaking their own individual plan, that you you are so affordable and so, I mean, it's not like people have to go to you like 50 times, like one session. It's one, you're so good that you can hone in one and done and they can go to esteemdynamics.org. And I didn't even know this till a week ago, but you have the most amazing podcast that is live at 8.30 Pacific time Wednesday. It's called Beat Your Genes. There's already 70 episodes. They can be listening to that. And and I, and that's almost like having a session with you. So that that's absolutely amazing. So for the people that are unwilling or unable to clean up their environment now. Hopefully they know that at least they need to do that if they want to succeed. Because a lot of people say, well, so you're telling me I'm going to fail because I can't. I'm not telling anybody they're going to fail. But what I'm telling people is the people that I've seen that have been super successful, like myself, like Shada, who's lost 100 pounds and kept it off for five years, like Heather, who has lost 300 pounds and is still losing. These people have no non-compliant food in their environment. The ones that I've seen that have been and they don't have the cravings and it's and it's been easy. So are there other things that people that either are unwilling or unable to clean up their environment? And we've talked about, you know, the food safes or, 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 or negotiation. Is there something else they can do? Like if they did more meditation or more exercises, there's some way that that will help them since they don't have the, the environment, which I think is the most important thing. Actually, to be the truth, if you understand the concept of the environment, the environment is essentially all inputs into your nervous system. So it's going to be who you're around. It's going to be the food that's under your hands. It's going to be the food that is competing with the food that's under your hands. It's 10 feet away. In other words, it's all these environmental factors. And at the end of the day, folks, it is an environmental problem. So we're, we're not, you know, the only other alternative is you. And that means your personality and then your personality means your genes and your genes are not something that we're going to change. So the, uh, the people that are listening to us and are aware of this, they don't need any more education about the details of what direction to go that's healthy. This they already know. Okay? So that, that for some people, that, that is a very important step and they're able to institute changes from that new knowledge. They happen to be naturally highly disciplined people. They may be disagreeable and pushy. Uh, they're going to institute it in their own family and they're going to roll it over everybody's head, whether they like it or not. And so this is what we're going to do. And what they needed to know is they needed to know what to do. OK. And so then they execute. So I've met some of those people and they always scratch their heads and wonder why anybody else is having a problem. Uh, all you needed to do is read the Starch Solution or the China study, execute on it and you're done now or unprocessed. They could have read unprocessed. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, is that for um, for the rest of us, 
that it isn't that simple. Um, what when we say we're not going to change our environment, I, I want to point out that that is actually the only thing you've got control over because you don't have control of your personality because your personality is you. So what we've got control over is the environment. The extent that you make efforts to make modifications in your environment, um, including negotiating with a partner, that's a change in your environment, you see. Um, it's getting more prepared and knowing how to prepare food. It's knowing where it is that you can go to get healthier food that's easy. It's making sure that we have a little nice Tupperware that we can take these things to work. Whatever it is that's involved in changing your environment, that is how it is that you're going to be successful. I don't know of any other way. Yeah. Okay, so I, I don't know that, that there's some fantastical way that we can reach inside your mind and say, I'm going to eat this, but I'm not going to eat that. I, I don't think so. I think that, that paying attention to uh, environmental variables and getting more competent and uh, more, more uh, determined, uh, sort of more diligent about environmental variables is precisely the path that we need to be paying attention to that's gonna uh, enhance your chances for better success. You've said everything that I was hoping you'd say and coming from you, they have to believe it. And you've completely explained why people have not taken me off of my offer to Skype for free with their families. Now it makes sense because they're embarrassed and they need to get over that and they need to have a conversation or they need to hire you to figure out how to coach them. But thank you so much for just corroborating everything I've learned from you and believe that the environment is so critical because we see you've been at True North for 30 years. I've only been going there seven years and I see people do fantastic when they're there yes. and fantastic when they're locked up at the McDougal program. Yes. But then you see them a year later and maybe they're not doing as fantastic. And that's because when they're there, they're in these perfect environments that yes. support their recovery. That's correct. That's you know? correct. That's exactly yeah. right. So uh, we, we are, you're, you're the best thing we have, <laughs> an extension of the McDougal program in True North to, to give people some kind of connection out there in the world. Uh, that plus some other of these food services. I know Colin Campbell's son has yeah. a food service that people can do. So in other words, people, we're working on these environmental problems. But uh, yeah, we, we this is where this is now where I recommend that people that leave True North, I recommend they hook themselves up with your program because they Thank need you. this ongoing support. And if you guys want to see Dr. Lyle in person and myself and Gustavo and Dr. Alan Goldhammer and Jean-Pierre and Dr. Carrie Saunders, please consider coming to the live Ultimate Weight Loss Conference Labor Day weekend at the Tuscany, September 1st, 2nd and 3rd. Gustavo, do you have any questions for Dr. Lyle? Because he's answered all of mine brilliantly. It's, uh, I agree with everybody else. Uh, we're typing comments. Dr. Lyle is a genius. <laughs> yeah, really. I, yeah, really. Yeah, you know, the genius is, oh, they're saying that because of the painting. Yes. Music. Yeah, right. I understand. That makes sense. So, well, um, makes I, sense. so I guess we can say goodnight to all the fat raccoons. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and remember, AJ, to let people know about this, all the videos that you and I have made. That that's we'll right. You know, one of the things is, is when you clean up your environment and get rid of all the bad stuff, you want to put in good stuff. So Gustavo and I have done several webinars, most of them free, some of them with a small free, which will show you how to keep this going and, and make some of the most delicious food. And uh, yeah. And again, esteemdynamics.org. There's so much information there. 70 podcasts. It's like, I mean, he's giving you everything, guys, for free. Get a session with this guy and have him Talk to your husband or your wife or the person that's not letting you clean up the environment because that's really just sad, really sad. All right, folks. Well, Thank you so much, Dr. Lyle. Thanks, Gustavo. Pleasure. Thanks all Great you guys for watching. Well. Very good. Bye, folks. Bye-bye.